so yeah speaking of that's a lot sorry I've packed no, a lot into that <laughs> well I was trying to decide if, you do, if I should continue on the issue of ontio, ont ontology or switch more over into the social sciences and get your take on the, your take uh, as someone who's in the natural science field on the social sciences and we're going to stipulate that some yeah, people no, have no. wacky ideas and that's that's fine but in the main in the, no, that's fine. I think, and again, um, those wacky ideas, we do, we do need to come back to those, I think, because I think they do your field a great disservice. Um, and indeed, in some cases, they do feminism a great disservice as well. Um, but in the main, so I collaborate with social scientists. In fact, we've got a grant running, um, started 1st of May, which involves a social scientist called Brigitte Nerlich um, here at Nottingham who is going to be um, effectively embedded in the lab for a couple of hours every week, who's going to just sort of um, uh, sit quietly or not so quietly in the corner. But I think we'd like her and she'd like to be as much as possible a disinterested observer and see just how we interact, how we explain things, how we drive the, the experiments forward, how we drive the research program, which is three and a half years forward. Um, and this has been tried before, but it's not really been tried in terms of our area of physics, in terms of the single atom manipulation. And we are so much image driven and image interpretation driven. Um, I'll be very keen to see how um, Brigitte's, uh, you know, how kind of take on this um, will either, you know, mesh with us or be sort of polar opposite to us in terms of um, just how we interpret the data we're getting. Um, it's, uh, I have a, a lot of time for the social sciences. I would argue, sir, I'm trying to choose my words here with care. I would argue that that's not a view that is incredibly well shared across the physical sciences. I would argue that there's a lot of skepticism about the value of social science. Um, in uh, across the physical sciences and an awful lot of that time that skepticism is either based again on just a few unrepresentative papers or a few unrepresentative results um and uh, actually an unwillingness to connect um or it's it's based on just the idea that well it's semi uh, it's only semi-quantitative. It can never be um, highly quantitative like you have, you know, in terms of the measurements we do in a piece of silicon, which is a hard lump of inorganic matter. You don't have all these sociological problems. You don't have all these um, controls to think about, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think the value of social science is probably not as widely appreciated no, is definitely not as widely appreciated across the physical sciences as it should be. Um, because, you know, as doing experiments at the, the single particle level, single atom level, thinking about how you, you know, crystals grow, thinking about gravity, string theory, thinking, all those things are important. But so too is how do we consider how society behaves? How do we consider um, different biases? How do we consider how, um, you know, politics Works. We're not going to do that with the same type of ideology. ideology um, sorry, that's the wrong word. We're not going to do that with the same level of quantitative precision. I'm really trying to think of how to uh, choose my words with care. We're not, we can't do that with the same level of quantitative precision. It has to be a much more statistical. It has to be a much more, um, in some ways, less focused. And I'd really like to hear your views on this. Less focused approach than we have in physics. You know, in physics, in many systems, what does a physicist, the running joke is, what's a cow to a physicist? Well, a cow is a large sphere. And if you want to add that little bit of extra detail, you, you'll add a little string on the end to represent the tail. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it's, that's what we do. We simplify, we simplify, we simplify down. It's a very reductive approach. And in the social sciences, you just can't do that. You can't have this reductive approach. You can't screen out everything and just focus on this one, one parameter. And because of that, it's therefore felt that, well, you know, they're not really doing science like a physicist. Not really doing science like a physicist would do it. Doesn't mean that it's not science. So it's, um, yeah, I think there's, there's a great deal of ignorance as well in some quarters. Not in all quarters. I, there's, there's, um, I think things about something called the impact agenda in the UK. And I've been a major um, 
uh, critic of it over the years, but I think one of the good things is that it started to connect the social sciences with um, the physical sciences a great deal more, and we need more of that. We really need more of that. Yeah, I think interdisciplinary. Did any of that work, make sense? Yeah, it, well, said to me, and I'm I'm sure that for the viewers did too. Know you were very clear and very coherent. Um, but yeah, I think that interdisciplinary work is is a good thing. The problem is then where do you get it published? Because <laughs> there's not often Absolutely. the interdisciplinary journals that take something as niche as you know combining these things. But that's a, a different problem. So yeah, in terms of like how I. I approach like, what we do, you know, I don't know to what extent people in the natural sciences understand the the explosion in statistical analysis and statistical power and big data and the the ways that, you know, just like with when, you know, so science, let's say, started sort of like, let's say, 1600. And every time you guys got a new piece of tech, things got better. And it's very much the same with the social sciences, in my opinion. You know, they kind of started, well, you know, you get polling in the 30s and, and, and so forth, but it's really after the Second World War that I think most of the departments for political science and sociology really began to spring up. And we had very crude instruments. We had very crude survey instruments, and we've been re refining them and improving them over time. But most importantly, when computers came around, we had the ability to do more statistical analysis than had ever been really possible when you were stuck with cross tabulations um, and you know small sample sizes of like around 150, and that would take you a really long time. So you know, my PhD supervisor talked about for his. I don't know if it was his master's thesis or his, his doctoral work, but having a shoebox full of punch cards because he wanted to test uh, the relative yes. deprivation theory on, a, on, a, on like 72 countries. And he had so entire boxes wow. of these punch cards that he was, you know, just to like have like three or four variables in a regression model. Well, now... It's heroic. It is heroic. Yeah, but he thought it was, you know, <laughs> time-saving compared to doing it by hand. Yeah. yeah. But now we have the ability to, you know, we're, we're getting into the era of, of big data. Um, releasing your data set with it with your publication is now becoming standard in a lot of social science journals so people can replicate your work and we're doing things you know in mean, time series analysis my, most people will understand from unemployment trends over time economic things you know so you want to understand change over time in the economy um, but also we're doing things like multi-level modeling controlling for the individual level the the neighborhood level and then the state level to try to isolate factors that are um, operating at different levels of social influence We've got, you know, structural equation modeling when we're looking at latent variables to try to see if the latent constructs of a set of questions in, in an international survey are the structural equation model that fits underneath is consistent across countries. So, uh, you know, we've done a lot of leaps and bounds. It's actually really hard for me in some ways to keep up with all of the new techniques that are constantly coming out and that you have to master. And then remember the ones that you knew already because you haven't used them in a long time or something. So. What we do in the social sciences is, yeah, it's, it's a fuzzier, let's say, here's a perfect example, perhaps. When I see the results of, like, the Clinton-Trump matchup in the U.S., and let's say the poll has her at 44% and him at 41%, and the margin of error of that poll is 3%, I add 3% plus and minus to both of those because I know it's not a fixed point, it's a band. And that's why we in the social sciences work with margins of error. We can tolerate a P equals, is equal to or less than 0 0.05 because it doesn't matter, like it would in medicine, if you've got a bit of error in the social sciences about the age effect, that's not gonna kill anybody. But in medical sciences, you need things really, really precise with a high P value. Um, or, you know, I'm no, sorry, low p-value, p equals 0, 0, 001. So we're, it's all about kind of like looking at those trends over time rather than making really precise estimates. And so I think that, yeah, when, you, when you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so I think maybe the, the disconnect there is we're being as rigorous. It's just that we, we have to be fuzzier and more tentative in our answers in order to make sure that we don't say things that are inaccurate. And maybe that makes us sound Absolutely. softer, no. but it makes us actually more honest. <laughs> more honest. Absolutely. No, this, this is exactly it. And in fact, you know, the, the key thing, and I'm coming back to Feynman again, is what's the sort of underlying, a key underlying characteristic of so much in science is uncertainty. Is that we can't, you know, 
one thing that does drive me up the one, and some people who say it's a matter of semantics, I would argue it's not a matter of semantics. I spent some time in the fourth year course talking about this. You know, you'll see time and time again, particularly in these YouTube threads, is that this paper proves, or this piece of science proves. Science doesn't prove anything. Now that might come across as a, you know, a very semantic, but it's not, it's fundamental. Proof is a concept in pure mathematics. With science, we don't, we never prove anything in that, in that mathematical sense. We um, get, you know, better and better guesses. We get better and better estimates, but we never know, you know, coming over the hill, there isn't something that's going to completely change our view. Again, I, I love coming back to quantum, but you know, the, the bridge between Newtonian mechanics and, and quantum mechanics at one level, Newtonian mechanics, classical mechanics, world of the, the physics of the world around us works extremely well, but we know that underlying that is something that unless, until we get to those really small levels, it doesn't pop out. And um, so the, the idea that, you know, you can prove something with science is something we have to be very, very careful with. And it also particularly in terms of public engagement and outreach and explaining science to the public, we have to be really careful, really careful to say that this is proven because um, it's sending out the wrong message. And as you say, it's, it's often fundamentally dishonest because we don't have that level of certainty. And we, as scientists, we live with that level of, of, of uncertainty. 